All right, welcome back. I'm particularly happy to introduce uh, Kazuya Koyama <laughs> because uh, his flight was cancelled yesterday, so I was afraid that <laughs> he couldn't make it. Uh, so we're glad to have him here, and uh, he's going to talk about dark energy. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in fact, my flight was cancelled yesterday, and I just arrived uh, half an hour before <laughs> my lecture. Um, so I'll talk about the uh, dark energy, and I think you had a very good introduction lectures uh, of cosmology. So this is a continuation of uh, lectures on cosmology. So I guess uh, it's better to wait. Okay, so I first give you uh, some reading list. Um, by the way, so the slides are already available on the web page. So if you go to the web page, you can download your lecture note. So I uploaded all the lecture note up to lecture four. It doesn't mean that you don't need to come here. You have to come here, but that, meaning, that means that you don't need to take note. You can just download the lecture note. So now we have a textbook. Uh, on dark energy, so this is a very good uh, starting point if you are interested in dark energy. So this is a, a huge uh, textbook. And then there is a very nice review uh, on dark energy. So this is uh, in 2006, so it's getting a little bit old, but this is still a very good uh, review article you uh, want to look at. And then also, uh, I will also talk about modified gravity, and this is probably uh, the most uh, useful reference. Um, so this is uh, in 2011. And I, I also talk about some observational tests of uh, these models, and this is a very good review uh, discussing not only theoretical aspect of dark energy, but also uh, discussions about observational tests. And of course, I include my review, so of course, uh, uh, you can look at my review. And of course, probably you know that uh, no one knows what is dark energy. So maybe I can finish my lecture here. So I think it's important to understand why we are so interested in dark energy, so why we need to spend four lectures learning about dark energy. So the first lecture is basically a try to critically examine the evidence of dark energy. So this is basically probably you already heard uh, in the cosmology lectures. But I try to make sure that what is the assumption we make if we say there is dark energy. And in understanding the assumption to get the evidence of dark energy is very important to construct uh, models of dark energy. And I also talk about cosmological constant today. So this is probably everyone agrees that this is the most uh, uh, probably a plausible, simplest answer to dark energy. But of course, we have a lot of problems with the uh, cosmological constant. So this is the first lecture. And, and then the next lecture, I will introduce a models of uh, dark energy and modification of gravity. And as you will see that there are uh, millions of models, and I think there is no meaning to discuss all the models. So again, the focus is why it's so difficult to construct dark energy modified gravity models. So what is the fundamental problem? So this is the second lecture. And in the final two lectures, I try to move on to a slightly different aspect to try to understand how we, how we test these theoretical models using observations. And the most important thing is to understand is how the structure in our universe uh, is formed. And I think in the next week, you will have a lectures on CMB and large scale structures. So you will learn more about the details of uh, observational proofs. But again, I will give you the basic uh, idea how we test dark energy uh, using observations. And I will show you some examples of uh, current observational tests. 
and also discuss why the next five to 10 years are so excited. And in the final lecture, so in the third lecture, I will mainly focus on linear structure. So linear means that the, the hom inhomogeneity in the universe is very small on large scales. So you can treat everything, deviations from isotropic homogeneous universe as a small perturbations. But you know that on very small scales, these structures become very nonlinear. And we will probably you already had a very good lectures on numerical method, and we will need a numerical method to understand the nonlinear structures. And again, having dark energy uh, modified gravity models, these nonlinear structure formations are very complicated. So I will try to explain uh, all of this. So feel free to ask questions during uh, lectures if you have any questions. Okay, so I think I try to change it to the first lecture. Okay, so let's look at the observational evidence uh, of dark energy and what is the cosmological constant. So I will show you there are three basic assumptions uh, you will make to show that there is dark energy. So let's remember, so first assumption, so this is the first assumption. So the first assumption is that our universe, on average, on large scales, is isotropic and uh, homogeneous. Okay, so this is the first assumption. I will come back to this assumption, but isotropy uh, is pretty much proved by cosmic microwave background uh, radiations, because if you look at the temperature of CMB photons, the difference of temperature is 10 to minus five. So this means that uh, our universe uh, looks very isotropic. Okay. But the second assumption is that uh, our universe is homogeneous. And of course, this is not the case on small scales because we have structures. So this is a distribution of galaxies in the less shift space. And if you look at this, uh, you see some structures. However, the argument is that if you average over on very large scales, these uh, distributions uh, uh, look very homogeneous. Okay. However, I come back to this. This assumption is very difficult to prove. So you have to remember that this is indeed an assumption. So this one, we probably can say that we proved isotropy of the universe because of CMB, but homogeneity, and looking at the scales, the CMB, you can prove the isotropy up to 6,000 megaparsec, but it's very difficult to prove the homogeneity, and in fact, the general relativity will play a role if you talk about homogeneity. So at the moment, this is the assumption. Okay. So once we assume these two, uh, homogeneity and isotropy, you can write down your metric in this form, so the freedom and robust and worker uh, metric. So the only degrees of freedom is the scale factor, and in the introduction cosmology lecture, you learned that the, there are three possible curvature uh, for the three space. Um, I'm sure you can read all this, <laughs> um, but you can guess. Uh, so this is the closed universe. This is the flat universe. This is the open universe. And so depending on the curvature, your three metric uh, is, so this is the flat case. So this is the very simple uh, coordinate. And if it is open, you have sine function here. If, uh, sorry, this is, if it is closed, uh, you have sine. If it is open, you have a sine hyperbolic function. So this is the open one. It doesn't look open, but it, it's open. So it's like sort of like. If you compute the 3D curvature, uh, so this curvature, so this is a three-dimensional Riemann uh, curvature tensor. So this is zero for flat space, and this is positive for closed space, and this is negative for open space.
So now here comes the second assumption. So we need to know the dynamics of this scale factor. Okay, so we have to use some gravitational theory and we use uh, general relativity. So general relativity is a theory to relate the geometry to matter. And the geometry is described by this Einstein tensor. So this is a combination of rich curvature and uh, rich scalar. And T mu nu uh, describes the matter. So this is the matter uh, energy momentum tensor. Okay, so this is the second assumption. So we use GR to describe the dynamics of our universe. So using the assumption one, so homogeneity and isotropy, you have to have matter energy momentum tensor in this form. Because using the homogeneity, you say that your metric is given by Friedman and Robertson Walker metric. Then you compute a left hand side, and then the right hand side should have the same symmetry to have the solution. And then the matter uh, energy momentum tensor should be written in this way. So this mu is four velocity, so this is time direction, so it's minus one. And there is no spatial direction because you assume spatial homogeneity. And you have two quantities, energy density and pressure. Okay, so the matter is described by these two quantities. And the important thing about GR, so this Einstein equation, is that there is an identity for the Einstein tensor. So the Einstein tensor satisfies this Bianchi identity. So this is nothing to do with gravitational equations. This is the identity for this Einstein tensor. So if you take divergence, so this is a covariant derivative, uh, it vanishes. So this means that if you take divergence, so this divergence of T mu nu should also vanish. And this is the conservation of energy momentum tensor. Okay. Okay. So now we apply this uh, to the freedom metric. So you get the freedom equation. So this is uh, giving the expansion rate of the universe in terms of the density and also 3D curvature. And combining the time-time component and space-space component, you get this acceleration equation. So A double dot uh, measures the acceleration of the expansion. And this is determined by low energy density plus 3P. P is pressure. Okay. So you get these two equations. And then from the conservation of energy momentum tensor, you get this equation. So this shows the conservation of energy density. So if there is no expansion of the universe, so this means that the energy density is constant. But due to the expansion of the universe, energy density basically becomes smaller and smaller. And this is determined by rho plus p. So think about these equations. You have three unknown quantities. You want to calculate the scale factor and energy density and the pressure. And you think that, well, there are three equations. So you may be able to solve for these three quantities, but this is not the case. So you have to remember there is a Bianchi identity. So this is the identity. So this means that the combining these two equations, for example, you can derive this equation. Okay. So this means that you have only two equations for three unknown quantities. So this means that you need one additional assumption that is to specify the equation of state. So equation of state is given by pressure over density. So this is what you have to put by hand so this is basically coming from microphysics of matter you have in the universe. Okay, so you cannot solve this equation of state from gravitational equations. Okay. Okay, so then this means that you need the final assumption. So final assumption is that we will introduce dark energy in addition to non matter. So no matter what I mean is baryons. So baryons is a very uh, uh, 
a common name for everything. So leptons is also, uh, I include leptons uh, in variance, but variance is basically the normal matter. I say normal matter, but of course we don't know much about cold dark matter. That's the reason why you had uh, lectures on dark matter. But to describe cosmology, what you have to know is just the equation of state. And the equation state for dark matter is uh, there is no pressure. So the equation of state for cold dark matter is zero. Okay, so even if you don't know what is dark matter, you just need to specify the equation of state. So dark matter, we say it's zero. And for baryons, I would say uh, equation of state is zero. Okay. And for radiation, you have equation of state one third. So this is for photons and neutrinos. For dark energy, we have no idea. So just put dark energy by hand. This is unknown energy. So th that means that we don't know about the equation of state. So we want to know about this equation of state. As usual, we will introduce this density parameter. So you divide your density by Hubble functions and you can do the same for curvature, and the Friedman equation becomes a very simple sum. So the sum of uh, each density parameter for the matter and the curvature is one. Okay? Okay, so now let's move on to the observations, the fact we measure. So what we measure is the distance. But remember that in order to measure the distance, you only need the assumption one. So assumption one is the uh, isotropy and homogeneity. And we said that the, our universe is described by Friedman metric. That is enough, okay? For the moment, we don't need to use any other assumptions. So using this, you want to calculate the distance. So distance, uh, this is a commoving distance, chi. So in the flat case, this is just chi squared. So chi is just a radius. And in order to calculate chi, so basically we use the uh, null geodesics, so the, your line element. So forget about the angular part. Your line element is you have a time part and this uh, spatial part. And so let's forget about this angular part. And then, uh, because the uh, photons uh, obeys the null geodesics, so this means that uh, the line element is zero, you can calculate this d chi in terms of dt. So you change chi to t and do the integration. And then uh, I introduce this uh, let's shift. So let's shift is the inverse of the scale factor. And then you can change integration over time uh, to the integration over let's shift. And by doing this, you introduce this Hubble parameter. So this is just a change of variable. And then you notice that this distance is determined by this Hubble function. Okay. But remember that this is just a geometry. Given Friedman metric, you can calculate as a distance, and you notice that this is all determined by uh, Hubble functions. And you already heard about luminosity distance and angular diameter distance, right? So uh, you can calculate this from uh, this commoving distance. So this is what you can measure uh, using supernovae or using CMB. So I, I will not repeat the derivation, but this is a very important equation you have to remember. But everything is determined by this commoving distance, which is the integration of uh, this Hopper functions. Okay? You can also calculate the age of the universe. Again, you find this E, so maybe it's better to remember E is the uh, Hopper function normalized by the Apple parameter today. So everything is determined by this function, and this is the only dimension for quantity. And this number 
will become very important for dark energy. So let's remember this number. So inverse of this, H0, uh, has the unit of years. So this is uh, roughly 10 to 10 years. And if you multiply the speed of light, so this becomes the length. So this is uh, 3,000 megaparsec. So these two numbers you have to remember. And we often use this uh, unit, natural unit. So I will explain later. So uh, in terms of energy scale, this is 10 to minus 42 giga electron volt. So remember this number. So this number will come up uh, quite often later. So now you want to measure first this number. So this number can be measured from luminosity distance or angular diameter distance. But for small z, uh, this is basically determined just by a uh, less shift and this H0 inverse. So you can measure directly H0. Or you can use CMB or supernovae to measure this H0. So this is a measurement of this H0. So in a, a bit funny unit. So this is kilometer per second per megaparsec. So it's around 70. But you see that the measurement from CMB, and so this is a measurement from this small redshift, there is some uh, discrepancies. And this is a, a hot topic at the moment. So if you're interested in, maybe you can look at this recent paper. And at the moment, this tension uh, is not explained. So this may have some in interesting implications to dark energy. So remember that this H0, we know roughly it's 70. But in fact, the measurements are not uh, so great at the moment. But what we want to know is not just H0. So what we want to measure is the equation of state of dark energy. So now we combine assumption two and three and try to parameterize uh, this E function. So this E function is the Hapur function. You can do that because if you know you have freedom of equation, you can write down this H in terms of matter. And if you assume what kind of matter you have in the universe, so you assume you have dark matter and baryons, you have radiation, you have curvature, and you have dark energy. So then you can compute this function, and then you can compute all these distances. So lambda CDM model, so this is the uh, fiducial model of our universe, is the assumption that the dark energy equation of state is minus one. So I will come back to this lambda. So basically, this means that the, so if this is minus one, this is just a constant. So this is cosmological constant. So this is just a number. So it doesn't depend on time. And then you try to see if this model can fit the observations. So you can measure these distances using supernovae, CMB, and baryon acoustic oscillations in the distribution of galaxies. OK, so then this is what we find. OK, so in lambda CDM, there is only one parameter. One parameter is constant, this omega lambda. And you have the density parameter for omega matter. And all the observations intersect and indicate that this omega lambda is not zero. So this means that there is something like cosmological constant. So cosmological constant just means that the equation of state is minus one. You can also try to measure W. So you can try to use this and try to also change this equation of state. And you can see that the constraint on W is not very precise, but minus one is consistent with all the observations. OK, so, so what is the cosmological constant? So I introduced the cosmological constant. So it's very easy to do in general relativity. So you just put constant in the action. So remember that GR is described by this action. So this is the rich uh, curvature. And you can introduce this constant in the action. And you can derive the 
all the equations, including this lambda. So you get this contribution lambda, which is proportional to g mu nu. And in the Friedman equation, you have this constant. So you say that there is a density which is related to this lambda divided by 8 by g. So this is the density of the lambda, but this is just a constant. And the interesting thing about lambda is that the pressure is minus this number. Okay? So equation of state is uh, W is P over rho. So this means that the uh, W is minus 1. And then you can calculate the acceleration. So the acceleration uh, is proportional to lambda. So this means that the a double dot, the second derivative is positive. So having lambda, you can accelerate the inverse. Okay? So, what's the problem? So we have the answer, right? So we have observations. Everything is consistent. If you have cosmological constant, you can explain everything. So why? We are talking about dark energy. So that's the question. So what's the problem? So lambda CDM works very well. It can expand all the observations. You can include the cosmological constant in Einstein GR without changing any theory. So why we bother? So I think that's the question we want to understand. Right? So to understand this, it's very important to understand the uh, number, so energy scales. So let's remember, so as I said, I will use a natural unit. So this is a very good exercise. I recommend yeah, you to do this exercise to change everything into natural unit. So the natural unit is to set a Planck constant and the speed of light and the Boltzmann constant to one. So then everything can be expressed in terms of the energy. For example, Newton constant in this unit uh, is uh, half the dimension of energy. And so this we call Planck scale. And this is given by 10 to 19 GeV. So this is the number you have to remember. At the same time, you can also express this Hubble constant just in terms of the uh, energy. So I, I said that this is 10 to minus 42 giga electron volt. So now you already see a huge hierarchy between the scales. So now you compute the energy density associated with this lambda. So the low lambda was lambda divided by G. So G uh, is M Planck uh, to the minus two. So you get M Planck squared times lambda. And remember that our universe, if there is a lambda, the Hubble parameter is just given by H squared over lambda over three. And it seems that our universe is mostly determined by lambda. So this means that the lambda is related to the uh, today's horizon scale, H naught. So this means that so because lambda is constant and the lambda dominates now, so this is H naught. So you can use this number. Then you compute the energy density associated with lambda. You get 10 to minus 48 GeV to the fourth. So this is 10 to minus 3 electron volt to the fourth power. So this is the number you will receive. Yeah. That's right, yes. That's an interesting question. There is an interesting theory relating dark energy to the mass of uh, neutrinos. However, at the moment, we don't know there is any connection. But it's very interesting if there is a connection. It's a very good point. In fact, this, is, this number, if you are a particle physicist, you probably are familiar with this. So this is related to the mass of the neutrino. Okay, so remember that, so this is what we observe. So the, it seems we have cosmological constant for the energy density is 10 to minus three. And in fact, we have this cosmological constant everywhere. 
So this is a prediction of quantum field theory, so known as vacuum energy. So if you remember your quantum physics, uh, if you have a harmonic oscillator, there is a zero-point energy. So zero-point energy is just given by Planck constant times frequency divided by two. So I said that I will set h bar to one, but I destroy it just to say that this is the quantum physics. So this is the prediction of quantum mechanics. But if you apply this to quantum field theory, like massive field and bosons and helmions, you will get the same kind of uh, zero-point energy. Later, I will use this fact that for bosons, so bosons is like photons and scalar field, so spin zero, spin one uh, field, uh, zero-point energy is positive. But for fermions, uh, the zero-point energy is negative. Okay. So now, this P is the momentum, and you want to sum up all these momentum, so you do the integration over this zero-point energy. Okay. So now you want to compute this, and uh, so P is the momentum, and this can start from zero to high energies, so infinite number, so you can expand this square root and calculates the integration by expanding this, assuming that P is larger than M. And you immediately notice that this integration diverges. Okay, so the first term you get is P max to the fourth power. So P max is that if you set infinity, this becomes infinity. So I set some max, a maximum number for the wave number. The next one is also uh, diverging. And then you get this m to the fourth power contribution. So this means that you really need to know the physics at very high energies. Remember, p is the wave number associated with the energy. So if you want to calculate this up to some max uh, wave number, this means that you have to know, we say, ultraviolet physics, so the high energy physics, to calculate these quantities. And the problem is that uh, these contributions diverge, and this depends on how you regularize, so how you introduce cutoff. But this time, uh, it depends on p max only logarithmically. And this part is quite robust. So the, independent of UV physics, you always get this kind of contribution. So the vacuum energy, conservative estimation is that it is mass to the fourth power. So what is the problem? So you say that you now observe vacuum energy of 10 to minus 3 electron volt. So this means that the contribution to the dark, dark energy, vacuum energy, so cosmological constant vacuum energy, the mass must be smaller than 10 to minus 3 electron volt. So this is a neutrino mass. So if you have electron in our universe, the vacuum energy is 0 0.5 MeV to the fourth power. And if you have Planck's scale mass, which is a natural scale, for gravity, the vacuum energy is Planck to the fourth power. And this is the famous 10 to 120 times the observed lambda. So now you see the problem. So now you can calculate the vacuum energy from particle physics. Compared with the observed vacuum energy, there is a huge difference. So this is not only the problem. So in the early universe, we know that there is a phase transition. So uh, we have an electroweak phase transition and QCD phase transition. And this phase transition will generate, again, vacuum energy. For weak, uh, electroweak uh, phase transition, you get contribution like 200 giga electron volt to the fourth power. For QCD, you get 0 0.3 giga electron volt to the fourth power. So any number you get, it's much larger than the observed vacuum energy. Okay. So then you wonder whether this vacuum energy is real. It's very strange. You calculate its diverges. Is that just a mathematical quantities? And in fact, it is not. And this vacuum energy was already observed 
in some sense. So this is known as the Casimir energy or Casimir force. So let's consider some scalar field. And you basically have uh, waves of scalar field. But then you have two plates. And you put the boundary condition that the scalar field vanishes on this boundary. And then you compute the scalar field uh, the momentum. And due to these boundary conditions, uh, this momentum for this direction, so this x direction, the momentum becomes discrete. So n is 1, 2, 3. So you have a discrete momenta inside this uh, two plate. So now you want to compute the same thing, zero point energy. So zero point energy was one half times frequency. So you basically want to sum up this frequency. The only difference is that this direction, the momenta is quantized. So you have a discrete momenta. So instead of integration, you have the sum of n for this direction. And you find that uh, this energy will diverge. So you have to introduce some regularization. So this is a very simple way to regularize. So you put some function by hand so that for large p, this becomes zero. So the energy stays uh, finite. But of course, if you take a to zero, this becomes one and everything diverges. Yeah, this is a very simple toy example. And then you compute uh, the total energy, the so energy between these two plates and energy uh, away from this plate. And this energy diverges if you set this regularization scale A to zero. However, you can compute the force between these plates by taking derivative with respect to D. So this is just coming from vacuum energy. And the vacuum energy is different because of these two plates. And you find the force between these plates is proportional to 1 over d to the fourth power and given by this precise number. So this is a very simple example using scalar field. But you can do the same calculation for electromagnetic field, for example. And this is a tiny force, but this has been measured. So this says that vacuum energy, if you naively calculate vacuum energy, it diverges. But if you calculate the physical force between two plates, it exists. Okay? And it's finite. So this means that the zero point energy really exists. Okay? So this is known as the old cosmological constant problem. So remember that zero point energy is not very important in the usual quantum field theory. Why? Because usually in the uh, quantum field theory, you don't care about the zero point of the energy. What is important is the difference of energies. For example, for Casimir force, I said that the energy is infinite if you do not regularize, but if you compute the derivative, it's finite. So this is what matters in the flat universe with no gravity. The problem of GR is that the GR matter curves the space-time. Even vacuum energy curves the space-time. So you cannot say that you don't care the zero-point energy. If you have energy, this changes your space-time. So this means that if you have electron in our universe, this creates the vacuum energy of 0.5 mega EV to the fourth power. If you trust GR, this gravitate, you create the expanding universe. And in fact, you find, so this is Planck scale, sorry. So, um, the Hubble scale becomes 10 to 6 kilometer. So having the electron, electron in our universe, the horizon scale becomes 10 to 6 kilometer. But we know that our universe is much larger. Right? The electron is not that heavy particle, 
but just having electrons in our universe, you have a huge energy. And this curves the space-time, and uh, your universe becomes so small. So that's the problem. But you say that, well, but you have a freedom to add lambda in the Einstein gravity, so just fine-tune it. Right? So you introduce some lambda, you know vacuum energy is huge, you can tune your lambda in the Einstein field action so that you reproduce this small lambda. The problem is that, as I said, the vacuum energy is very sensitive to the ultraviolet physics. So cutoff of high energy momenta was a mass. So if you go to high energy and more and more high energy, you don't know how many particles you have. And then all of these new particles contribute to vacuum energy. So basically, you have to know all the knowledge of UV physics to do the tuning to get this observed lambda. So this is the fundamental problem. So in technical term, this means that this tuning you can do at low energies is not stable, meaning that if we introduce new particles, you have to tune it again. So this is not stable. So we say this is uh, uh, unstable under radiative corrections. So you may think that, uh, uh, so how we solve this problem? And in fact, this problem is nothing to do with the accelerated expansion of the universe, right? So vacuum energy exists. If it exists, it curves the space-time too much. And you have to solve this problem before looking at the acceleration problem. So one possibility is to have some symmetry. So the supersymmetry is one example. So as I said, the vacuum energy depends on you have bosons or hermions. And this sign changes whether you have bosons and hermions. And you notice that if you have the same number of bosons and fermions, you can cancel the vacuum energy. And if this is the case, this works very well. The only problem is that we never see super particles. Right? So if supersymmetry is exact, you should see uh, the same number of bosons and hermions, but this is not what we observe. And we believe that the supersymmetry is broken at some high energy, like uh, TeV. So this means that if supersymmetry is broken, you again get vacuum energy of this order. This is, again, too large compared with the observed vacuum energy. So this does not solve the problem. So people argue that, well, maybe there is some argument to say that if lambda is zero, there is some special symmetry. We don't know what it is, but maybe there is a symmetry with this cosmological constant zero. And assume that this is a very precise symmetry which exists at quantum level. Then you can do the tuning because the, uh, the small cosmological constant breaks this symmetry and create all these collections. But these collections are created because you break the symmetry. So this means that if you do the uh, tuning and you get a very small number, this is a very, very fine-tuned value. But assuming that there is an exact symmetry with zero cosmological constant, this tuning is natural because quantum collections only create the same orders of cosmological constant. So this is known as the uh, naturalness. So people try to come up with uh, the theory are having this symmetry. So this sounds all very good, but what is the symmetry? So still no one knows. So another interesting attempt is known as the self-tuning. So let's imagine that you have a huge vacuum energy. So somehow we do not see this huge vacuum energy. But there may be some extra field and this absorbs this huge vacuum energy so that we do not see the vacuum energy. 
However, there is a very famous Nogo theorem by Weinberg and saying that basically this is the same as fine tuning. This proof is very simple but very difficult to understand. So I recommend you to look at original Weinberg's Nogo theorem paper. I forgot to put the uh, reference, but you can usually maybe Google it and you can find the original paper uh, by Weinberg. The idea is quite simple. So let's say you have a huge vacuum energy, but somehow there is an additional field so that this field absorbs this large vacuum energy so that the space-time remains flat. Okay? And then, because uh, the space-time is flat, this additional field phi is also stays constant. So assuming these conditions, what he showed is that the action you get is this form. So you have the vacuum energy from usual matter. So this is a standard model particles. So it, this creates a huge vacuum energy. But then you have an additional field so that you want to compensate this huge vacuum energy so that you want to tune this. However, in the end, what you are doing is the fine tuning between this potential energy coming from this field and the vacuum energy. So there is no dynamical tuning, so this is just a fine tuning. So this is the argument. This sounds trivial, but surprisingly, many attempts try to do this dynamical tuning to eliminate vacuum energy uh, basically fails because of this no-go theorem. So this is a very uh, strong theorem. And of course, you may try to change this assumption. This is what people are doing. For example, even having vacuum energy and you tune it to make it small, you don't need to have a flat space. You can have a dy dynamical space. So this is one way. But then I have to say that still we do not know a very good model for it. So there are many attempts. So I'm showing this because uh, we don't know the answer. So you need to find the answer. So you have to choose which one you are interested in. So another idea is to change gravity. So the problem of vacuum energy is that uh, if you have a huge vacuum energy in general relativity, this vacuum energy gravitates. And this is not what our universe uh, is, looks like. So you want to change your Einstein's gravity so that if you have a cosmological constant, there is some function so that this cosmological constant does not change your space time. So this is the idea. Again, the idea is always good. But how to get this equation? So this must be a very non-local equation because no matter matter, it looks like GR, but for cosmological constant, it looks very different. So you have to change the nature of gravity depend, depending on the scale you have in your system. Again, we do not have a very good theory to realize this. But there is one interesting idea is using these extra dimensions. So if you consider some uh, two-dimensional object, so let's say in four dimensions, you have two-dimensional string. So this is two-dimensional object. And so this is four-dimensional universe. And so you have two-dimensional string. Okay. So you put some cosmological constant on this string. So in this case, this is just a tension. And what happens is that this tension or cosmological constant does not gravitate. And in fact, this tension only changes the, these two-dimensional extra dimensions. And you want to apply this to six dimensions, so it's very difficult to imagine, but your universe is 4D, and you have two extra dimensions. You put cosmological constant on this brain, but this cosmological constant does not change the geometry of this four-dimensional universe. 
Instead, it only changes the geometry of two-dimensional extra dimensions. So this means that even if you have a huge vacuum energy, you do not feel this cosmological constant, and this just changes, changing the extra dimensions. Yeah. So five dimensions, you have one extra dimension. And this nice property happens only when you have two dimensions. So you, just two. Yes. You have questions? That's a good question. So the question is, is there any action? Uh, no. <laughs> so that's a problem. So it's a very non-local uh, equation. I don't know how we get this. And in fact, the problem is Bianca identity, right? So you have to have Bianca identity for G mu nu. And you, have, you want to have matter conservations to how you satisfy Bianca identity. So that's also very difficult. So all of what I said is that we don't know the answer. OK? So this is a fundamental problem. And the fact the acceleration did is to make the problem worse. Right, so now you get the additional problem. So let's imagine that we have this old cosmological constant problem, phi vacuum energy does not gravitate. But let's assume that we solve this somehow. Then you need to ex explain why the universe is accelerating. We need cosmological constant, right? So this means that the accelerated expansion of the universe makes uh, things worse. And we seem to have more problem. So this is known as coincidence problem. So if you look at the energy density of radiation and the matter, so radiation scales like a to minus 4, and the matter scales like a to minus 3, and the cosmological constant is constant. And it's surprising that somehow, today, all these three densities have similar densities, especially the matter density and the lambda density is very similar today. But looking at this picture, they have a very different density in the early universe. They will have a very different density in the future. So why today we have this agreement between density of matter and density of lambda? Is it just a coincidence? So this is a coincidence problem? Or there is a deep meaning to it? OK, so of course, there is a very simple answer, the anthropic principle. I, I have no comment on this, but <laughs> and so that's the problem. OK, so I think, I, I hope I convinced you that this is a huge problem, right? So we have. We had the old cosmological constant problem. Even if we didn't find accelerated expansion of the universe, this was the problem, right? So the problem was that the vacuum energy exists, but it, it does not gravitate in the way it should be. And in fact, this accelerated expansion of the universe may help us because understanding why uh, the universe accelerate now, whether this is caused by some fine-tuned cosmological constant, why it's entirely different from cosmological constant, this may have something, something to say about the old cosmological constant. So remember that when we talk about dark energy, people talk about usually accelerated expansion but you have to remember that we are always having this old cosmological constant problem. And we are also hoping to find a solutions to this very old theoretical problem. OK, so I think um, uh, from now on, I focus on the accelerated expansion of the universe to dark energy problem. So now we want to see which assumption we want to change. Because assuming these three assumptions, we have the evidence that we need dark energy. So this means that we have to change one of them. Okay, so the first one was homogeneity and isotropy. Second one was GR. And third one 
what's the matter content of the universe. So which one you want to choose? So shall we do the vote? So if you want to doubt this assumption of homogeneity and isotropy, please raise your hand. Okay, it's not very popular. Maybe GR is wrong. If you think GR is the problem. Okay, that's... Okay, so maybe we don't understand what is matter in our universe. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's look at uh, this uh, in turn. So we come back to this uh, freedom of metric. So let's uh, look at that uh, more precisely. So there are two principles we use in cosmology. One is the Copernican principle. So this says that we are not at a special location in the universe. So this is the principle. And the cosmological principle says that on large scales, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So we used this second principle to get the freedom of metric. So the mathematical proof is this. So if all observers measure isotropic distance receipt relation, then the space time is freedom. So this is the mathematical statement. In fact, you do not need homogeneity here, right? So you just say that if you have observer, uh, if this observer measure isotropic expansion, and then you can show that this is the case for all observers, then the metric is freedom. Then you can immediately see the problem, right? So how you show this is the case for all observers in the universe. That's impossible. Because we only see from the Earth. You never know if you go to the other side of the universe, you never know you see the isotropic universe. Okay? So in order to sh show that your space-time is described by freedom metric, you need to have this assumption that the universe we see is the universe people see in the other side of the universe. That's the reason why we need the Copernican principle. Right? So assuming Copernican principle, we are not at a special location in the universe, meaning that if we measure the isotropic expansion of the universe, from this assumption, this means that all observers will measure isotropic expansion then it's enough to use this mathematical proof to show that our universe is described by freedom of metric on large scales. But then how we show the Copernican principle is correct. That's a huge problem. And there's a very nice review by Chris Clarkson, and there's a very nice textbook uh, discussing about this principle. So I recommend you to look at uh, this uh, this review paper and textbook. And this is, in fact, deep problem. So how we show this spatial homogeneity in GR? That's very difficult. So this is a, a diagram in GR. So this is the world line of uh, observer. So this is uh, time. So this is the constant time hypersurface. So this is a spatial space. And we want to show the homogeneity on this space. But what we observe is this past light cone, and in fact, this surface of light cone is the observations. So you only uh, observe the intersection between light cone and this uh, constant hypersurface. So then how we show this spatial hypersurface is homogeneous? So that's a very difficult uh, problem in GR, and in fact, it's very difficult to show. So I think it's natural to doubt this assumption. And this uh, was done probably 10 years, 15 years ago, a lot. And people come up with this Boyd model. So let's forget that we are living in, a, uh, we are not living in a special place. Let's assume we are indeed living in a very special place. Let's assume that we are living inside this huge void. 
huge under, lens, under dense region. Let's say this is a 10 gigaparsec size, and um, you have a huge difference between density around us and the density away from us. And in fact, there is a very famous metric describing this kind of inhomogeneous uh, universe. And this looks like Friedman universe, but the scale factor now depends on time and this radial direction. And then you have a different expansions for radial part and uh, angular part. And what you can do is to basically find this density profile so that you can calculate the distance from us and compared with supernovae and CMB. And what people found that indeed it's very easy to explain supernovae in this model without cosmological constant. Okay? Having this kind of profile, you can easily explain supernovae observations. You don't need dark energy. So this is one indication that, but this basically you are saying that you have to live at a very special point in the universe, right? However, after that, people studied this kind of model a lot, and people found a lot of problems with this model, so this simple model. And if you calculate the H0, the horizon constant today, we measure like 70, but in this model, H0 must be like 50. So this is already excluded. And also, if we observe clusters in this model, because there is a radial profile, clusters have a large radial velocity. And if we have a cluster, uh, so, uh, clusters of galaxies, and so this is moving because you have this spatial profile in the universe, and then CMB photon comes, and then this will be scattered by electrons, and this creates additional CMB anastropies. And this is known as the kinetic uh, scenario F, uh, the little bit effect. And this effect is huge in this model because clusters feel this profile. And in fact, even current data, this simple model is already excluded. The idea is very interesting, but again, to explain accelerations without using lambda is very difficult. And this is very important. You have to combine many observations to show that. But at the moment, I think the consensus is that it's very difficult to explain accelerations by orating this assumption. And there is a related argument, which is related to the coincidence problem, which is the back reaction. So we know that the universe becomes very inhomogeneous at late times. So in some sense, the homogeneity assumption is broken on small scales. But we say that on large scales, on the average, it's homogeneous. But how we prove that? But again, this is a very difficult problem in GR. And there are a lot of arguments about the effect of this small scale inhomogeneity on the expansion of the universe on large scales. And one nice idea of this back reaction is that due to these small scale inhomogeneities, these inhomogeneities back react, and then the expansion accelerate. If this is the case, you can solve the coincidence problem. So if you look at the energy density of dark energy, and this is the energy density of matter, when matter becomes the matter energy density becomes the same as dark energy energy density. This is basically when nonlinear structure forms. So if dark energy is not really a dark energy, this is due to this back reaction from nonlinear structure formation. You can explain why you see this dark energy today, because this is because you create nonlinear structures today. And we exist because of nonlinear structure formation. Again, the idea is good, but uh, of course, the question is this. Can you get this kind of very large back reaction from small scale inhomogeneities? I think the answer is no. I think that's the consensus. But this does not mean that there is no effect. 
So people are discussing about the magnitude of this effect. This is 1% or 10 to minus 5. That is not decided yet. However, uh, probably it's very difficult to explain the acceleration along this line. OK, so let's look at the second assumption, so general relativity. So why we use GR from the beginning? So one reason is that, of course, observationally, we know that GR is a very good theory of gravity. It can explain solar system test and other things. So in the next lecture, I will talk about more theoretical point of view, why GR is special. But let's look at this observational evidence of GR. So in the solar system, what you calculate is, again, the metric. And you compute the time-time uh, -time component of the metric, for example, sourced by the sun. So you have a usual potential m over r. And the spatial part, you can have the same potential. And the, uh, this gamma parameter, so this will appear later, is known as the post-parameterized uh, uh, Newton par parameter. GR predict gamma is 1. And in Newton theory, you don't care about spatial perturbations, so gamma is zero, is a Newtonian theory. And these two potentials uh, determine the bending of light. So in the solar system, because of the sun's gravity, the position of the stars look different because the gravitational field uh, bend the trajectory of the light. And you compute this bending, and in GR, it is given by this number, and this is the measurement, and this is very close to 1. And in fact, in terms of this gamma parameter, the deviation of uh, this parameter from GR is 10 to minus 4. Also, you can compute the time delay, so you send signal from Saturn, there is a time delay due to the gravitational field of the sun. Again, you can compute. And, and Cassini satellite went to Saturn, and we did this uh, experiment. And again, you get GR. And the accuracy is, again, 10 to minus 5. So remember that GR is a very precise theory of gravity. Okay? So if you change gravity, you have to always worry about this. That's the reason why we trust GR, but this is not only the reason why we trust GR. We have these binary pulsars. So we have two binary pulsars, and they basically uh, rotate together, but then they emit gravitational waves, and this orbit decays because they lose energy because of gravitational waves. So this decay of the orbit this is a prediction of GR, and they agree very well. And in fact, this is not the only the story. So you can calculate all of these uh, collections due to GR. And of course, the problem of testing gravity is that usually you do not know the mass of these two binaries. right? So you don't know the mass. So what you can do is to assume GR. Try to combine many observations. In this case, they are using a lot of different post Keplerian motion parameters. Try to find the mass. And assuming GR, so this is the allowed region. So this line is basically what you observe. And then you can pinpoint the mass of these pulses. The idea is that if you use wrong theory of gravity, there is no consistent solution. And GR, remarkably, gives a very consistent mass. So this is the way to test gravity, even if you do not know about the matter, the mass. And this is very important for cosmology, too. So I will come back to this in, t um, in tomorrow's lectures, so how we test gravity even if you do not know about matter. But this also means that GR is very accurate. So just uh, summarize uh, where we test gravity. So let's imagine you have uh, some spherical object. 
So you have a spherical object with radius r and mass m. So there is a very nice paper summarizing all the tests of gravity using two parameters. So this object gravity is described by first usual gm over r. So this is the gravitational potential. So this is the gravitational potential. So if gravitational potential becomes zero, this means that uh, this is a very strong gravity. And another quantity you can compute is the curvature of this object. So this, is, this measures the spatial curvature created by this object. So this scales like gm over r cubed. Okay? So this is the curvature. Okay? So if you go up, you have a very high curvature, means that your space time is very different from flat space. And all the tests we do is basically around here. So this is the solar system test. So this is the binary pulses. So this is all very high curvature. But if you think about cosmology, you are looking at a very low curvature. So maybe it's probably easier to see the scale. So you fix mass and change your radius of this object. So this is one solar radius. This is one AU. And if you increase radius, you go in this way. So this is one megaparsec. So the horizon scale is uh, uh, 3,000 megaparsec around here. And you notice that there is no test of gravity here. You tested GR very well around here. Then you see a lot of problem in cosmology. For example, you need dark matter. And you need dark energy if you go to this very low curvature regime. And we trust GR because we have a lot of tests of GR around here. But we never tested GR around here. So this is a reason why there may be a reason to doubt GR uh, given the existence of dark energy. Okay? And maybe you heard about this discovery of gravitational waves. So this is probably not the proof of uh, GR yet, but this is testing gravity at very strong gravity, so very uh, large potential and very high curvature. Its scale is very different, but around here. So now we get a very good handle of gravity using gravitational waves, but you can do similar things using cosmology down here. But remember that we are testing gravity in a very different regime. And only the precise test of GR has been done around here. OK, so this is the final question. So what is matter? So this is very simple because we don't know. So we just add dark energy, right? So that's very easy. The problem is that. If you're just looking at the expansion of the universe, you only have one parameter. So it's the equation of state. You don't need to know what is dark energy. You just need to know what is equation of state. So how you distinguish between different dark energy, if you can observe only background expansion, which is only determined by equation of state. So that's the question I want to ask in the tomorrow's lecture. And especially, I distinguish between changing gravity and adding different matter, but this is not very difficult. Uh, this is not uh, easy to do, because if you change gravity, you change basically left-hand side of Einstein equations. You change gravity. You add dark energy. You change right-hand side. So how you distinguish between the two? Whether you are changing gravity or you are just having weird matter. So that's the reason why, in fact, uh, distinguishing between dark energy and modified gravity is not well defined. And you have to be more careful how you distinguish between different models. So changing matter and changing gravity, in fact, probably there is no reason to separate. But we want to understand how we, want to, we can separate different models from observations.
Okay, so, um, so to finish my first lecture, just to mention that there are a lot of astronomical surveys try to understand dark energy. So this is the year. So this is the planned astronomical surveys. So now dark energy survey is ongoing. We have uh, extended both surveys uh, ongoing. But then in Europe, we have this U grid. So the last week we had a meeting in Lisbon. So this uh, uh, surveys uh, more than 1,000 people in Europe are involved to understand the nature of dark energy. So this is a mission state, uh, statement of Euclid. So this is a satellite mission. So it's try to understand the nature of acceleration of the universe, try to test gravity on cosmological scales from the measurement of cosmic expansion history and growth of structure. So all of these statements, you want to understand why more than 1,000 people are interested in doing this. I think I hopefully convinced you that there's a strong theoretical motivations, but this is not enough. Why people try to do astronomical observations to understand the nature of dark energy. So this is what I want to explain uh, in my lectures. So basically to understand why this is the mission status for Euclid, why this is important. So in the next lecture, I will try to explain the examples of the models of dark energy and modified gravity. This will give you the taste of uh, current theoretical models. As I say, there is no answer. So I cannot give you the answer, but you can see how difficult it is. Then tomorrow, based on these theoretical models, I will discuss how we can distinguish between these theoretical ideas using structure formation. And I will discuss about current observational tests and then discuss about nonlinear structures. I think I'm a bit over time, so um, you can ask any questions during a uh, coffee break. And I try to have more question time in the next lecture.